So much for that. OK, welcome, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Bue Miller. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief of The New York Times. And I'll briefly introduce our, our uh, we have fantastic panelists today. I'll briefly introduce them. I'm going to um, hit them all with questions after that. Um, and then we'll get a conversation going. And uh, in the last 20 or 25 minutes, turn to you, because I know you have lots of questions. So right here, we have Peggy Johnson. She is the Executive Vice President of Business Development at Microsoft. Why is she here? Uh, well, for one reason, uh, Microsoft just last month announced the first five, Fortune 500 company to do so, announced they would no longer have forced arbitration for sexual harassment claims, which is very interesting and impressive. And also, um, Microsoft is supporting legislation in Congress, in the US Congress, to ban such agreements. Uh, next to Peggy, we have Marianne Monsef. She's the Minister of Status of Women in Canada. She was uh, born an Afghan citizen in Iran. And in her new job, she has uh, begun a plan for um, a national campaign, a national violence against women strategy. It's already in, in work, in the works, and she's beginning to carry it out. Next to Maryam is Lisa Sherman. She's the president and CEO of the Ad Council. And uh, she is behind uh, it's a national nonprofit in the United States. And she is behind a number of public service campaigns, including one from a few years ago of It's On Us about sexual harassment. And just yesterday, the Ad Council announced a new campaign called um, That's Harassment. And um, unfortunately, we don't have any of the um, ads to show you. But they're, uh, trust me, they're very, very powerful. I just saw one. And I gasped when I saw it. Um, next to uh, Mary Ann is our, our lone male on the panel. Welcome. It's Dacker Kelt Keltner. And he is from, he's a psychology, a psychology professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of The Power Paradox, which uh, came out in 2016. It's about why, um, how power corrupts. And he's going to tell us, which he told us just now, that he feels that um, power corrupts men more than women, which I found interesting. Very controversial claim. He's also, for those of you, um, a person, he's also was a consultant behind uh, the wonderful Pixar movie, Inside Out. So. Um, about the emotions. And last but not least is Winnie um, Bianima. She's the um, executive director of Oxfam International. She's an international leader on women's rights and on gender and development in the um, much of the world. Uh, and she recently spoke out about um, sexual harassment at Oxfam and what um, Oxfam, how Oxfam is addressing that. So this is a really interesting panel. So let me start with Peggy. Tell me, uh, what was behind Microsoft's decision to, uh, to end the uh, forced arbitration? Well, a, a little bit of the backstory is, I would say probably over the last year, as a company, we've been having discussions as a corporation. Do we weigh in on these social movements? Do we say something here about Me Too? And um, about that same time, my colleague Brad Smith at Microsoft was visiting Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. And he was just in the process, is in the process, of writing the first legislation coming out of the Me Too uh, movement. And essentially, he shared with Brad that something like 60 million Americans have in their employee contract a provision that says, if you raise a sexual harassment claim, you have to go through private arbitration. And if anything, the Me Too movement taught us is that we're silencing voices. We need to hear these voices. And so Lindsay said, the, this legislation is going to do away with those provisions. And so immediately, Brad said, we're in. We're going to support the legislation. It's still working its way through. But we're, we were, as Elizabeth said, the first Fortune 100 company to get behind it. And I would urge you in the audience to, to take a look at it. And if you, and if you feel uh, so moved, to please uh, join us in, in supporting that. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, when Brad came back to Seattle, uh, he said, do we have any of these provisions in our employee contract? And as a matter of fact, a small number of our American employees had the provision in their contract. So we immediately took it out. But we did so. It was only a small number. We had actually never acted on the provision. But we took it out as a statement to our employees, our employees who were asking us Speak up about this. This was a big statement for them, and particularly our millennial employees. They come in the door saying, we want you to weigh in on these issues. And so we did. And I, again, I would, I would ask others in the audience to take a look at the, the legislation and hopefully help join us. 
Great. Barry, let me ask you about your campaign. Um, you, you said you've begun to carry it out. How do you carry this out nationally in a country as large as Canada? Well, firstly, let me acknowledge the privilege it is to be part of this conversation, to be here with all of you, change agents, people with power and influence to get things done. Um, Canadians mandated our government to, if you get elected, you better go out there and come up with the first federal strategy to address and prevent gender-based violence in Canada. And we began that work long before Me Too. We began that work as soon as we came into office. My predecessor, Minister Patty Haidu, went across the country, and it's a large country with a diversity of experiences, and heard from survivors and their families, heard from frontline service providers and from experts and academics, you know, what are uh, the, the most effective ways that a, a, get a government can intervene and be part of the solution. And Canada is a federation, and so there are provinces and territories that had done a lot of good work, and we didn't want to duplicate their efforts. We wanted to fill the gaps. That work led us to uh, the first gender-based violence strategy, which we announced this past June. It has money attached to it, which is really important. Broadly, this strategy falls under three pillars. The first, and it's the one that we need to focus on the most, is around prevention. The second is support for survivors and their families. And the third, which Peggy alluded to earlier, is a focus and uh, investment in a more responsive, in more responsive legal and justice systems. So that in Canada, where uh, probably about 5% of survivors ever come forward to seek justice, that they are able to be, uh, they're able to go through a process that doesn't further stigmatize them. Now, for me, I think the sustainability of my efforts as minister in this role is focused on two areas distinctly. Firstly, why do we need to end and why do we need to prevent gender-based violence? It goes far beyond the human rights imperative. The human right to dignity and to live a life free of violence is important. And a lot of people fought hard for that recognition. But for our government, and I'm sure for all the people in this room, there is an economic imperative at stake here too. The greatest barrier to addressing the wage gap is inequality. The greatest barrier to achieving equality for women and gender diverse peoples, we believe, is gender-based violence. And so that's why we need to tackle it. And that's why we need to work hard to ensure that Me Too, as we've heard, is a phrase that eventually over time is no longer used in this context. The sustainability of my efforts, the wisdom that guides me, the, the fire in my belly, if you will, comes from the women's movement. Issues of violence, whether it's gender-based or related to harassment, aren't new. Advocates in the movement have been telling us this for decades upon decades. They've been fighting to provide shelter on humble budgets to, to people who are fleeing these situations. They've been telling us how to do this work for decades and decades. And our job, firstly, is to honor their contributions. Secondly, to keep listening to that collective wisdom because we don't have to come up with too many new strategies. And the third is to invest in the sustainability of those efforts. And we just did that. Last week we announced $20 million to organizations that support those who are most vulnerable to this kind of violence. And we're gonna continue listening to them because our success depends on it. Great, thanks. Lisa, tell me about the emphasis behind the That's Harassment campaign since it's so new. Well, um, the ad, I work for the Ad Council, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the Ad Council really convenes the best and brightest in the advertising, marketing, communications, and tech worlds, and we're able to leverage the incredible talents across those industries to raise awareness and to educate people on the most pressing and important social issues of the day. And as I think we know, this has risen to the top as one of those issues. Um, 
And so we worked with um, actor David Schwimmer, who has been incredibly passionate about this issue. He actually approached us about two months ago um, and said that he had begun to film reenactments of live stories from women who had experienced some form of sexual harassment. And I think there's been a debate, you know, I think the most egregious, awful um, abuses are at one end. They're very black and white. There's no question. I think there are some that fall into perhaps one would consider a gray area. And so he wanted to really highlight through these stories, these first person stories, what is harassment? And they're very hard hitting. They're very powerful. As Elizabeth said, you watch them and your skin crawls. Um, they're experiences that many of us have probably experienced. And I think our goal is to um, help to raise awareness and educate people on what harassment is, not just for those who are the victims, but for those who are the bystanders, who can be helpful in, in, in supporting the victim in hopefully raising their hand to tell their story. Okay, Dacker, now it's up to you. The, in The Power Paradox, you start out, you, you, your, your, your thesis is that uh, people start out being um, benevolent, they wanna help others, they're, they're driven by the good in them, but as they get more and more power, um, they think of themselves, they have impulsive behavior, they can't control themselves, they, um, they're, um, uh, so why do you think this very controversial thing you just said, that women uh, uh, are better at that than men? Are, are better at better, you know, are more um, altruistic leaders than men? Yeah, so, um, you know, when Harvey Weinstein uh, initiated the Me Too revolution, and it really is a revolution, I think, <laughs> on par with the Kinsey Report uh, six decades ago, where we're really reconceptualizing sexual dynamics and relations between men and women in, I think, productive ways. Uh, I realize that this is just a regu regularity of human behavior, and that's really the work of my lab for the past 25 years and dozens of other labs around the world. What we know, if you give any human being a bit of power, they become more impulsive. So you may have heard of a study we did in Berkeley where we tracked really wealthy cars and poor cars approaching a pedestrian zone. Uh, of course, wealthy cars have more power. The people have more power. Uh, you have to stop for pedestrians in a pedestrian zone. Poor cars stop 100% of the time. 54% of the time, wealthy cars drive through the pedestrian zone, uh, risking the fate of those individuals waiting there, breaking the law. Second thing is power, and I'm gonna get to your question, which is, I think, the question of our generation. Um, power incapacitates, I hate to say this to this audience, your frontal lobes. Uh, it, <laughs> we know from really compelling neuroscience that uh, it pretty, can, if I feel powerful, I really focus on the self, I lose sight of other people. Uh, and literally, Naomi Eisenberger has done research showing uh, it takes parts of your frontal lobes to empathize with other people, to know what they're thinking, to know how they're feeling. When I feel powerful, those frontal lobes are deactivated. Pretty remarkable. Translate this to the contemporary context of men and women, and what social psychologists are calling this is sexual overperception which is if I'm powerful and I'm a man and I'm interacting with a woman who's less powerful, I'm just gonna be feeling more sexually aroused and that's well documented in a lot of studies. I'll act on those impulses, I'll be approaching their space, saying suggestive things, et cetera. Here comes the problem. I erroneously believe the woman around me is attracted to me and in fact, she's repulsed, right? Uh, or anxious, so that's bad news and that kind of felt like Harvey Weinstein, was the dramatic unfolding of that. But here's what's interesting about power and what gives me hope, <coughs> and I, why I think women in power is the most, I think out, it's the most interesting social movement alongside inequality today. Um, Robert Caro, the great biographer of Lyndon Johnson, there are two theses about power. Power leads to abuse, and power, Robert Caro says, reveals, right? It reveals your stronger tendencies. Regrettably, men, feel too much arousal in general, and they're sort of attracted to almost everything, so power amplifies that tendency. Uh, but women tend to be more collaborative. They tend to act in ways as a default that bring up, lift up the welfare of many. And so there are suggestive data now hitting the presses that women in power, you don't see corruption as readily in governments, you don't see abuse, you don't see 
the abuse that, that undermines the, civ the civil fabric of organizations. So that's why we should Can I just do a follow-up? So are you yeah. just saying this is a problem of testosterone? What are you saying? I mean, that power, um, uh, men are more prone to this than women? Is this hormones? What it, what, is it learned behavior? People always blame testosterone. And it's a much more complicated <laughs> story I mean, than that. I, I think what it is is there are just these default tendencies, some default tendencies that define men and women. And one of the biggest is men tend to take more risks. They tend to be a little bit more aggressive. In fact, a lot more aggressive if you look at worldwide data. And they tend to be, they tend to sexualize things. And so if you give a man power, those default tendencies will be expressed. Women tend to be more collaborative, cooperative, empathetic. You give them power. Studies show that it'll, it'll amplify those pro-social tendencies. It's utterly, utterly fascinating. <laughs> OK, so na You're next. You're not believing it. Well, I know. I'd, I'd like to believe you. No. <laughs> um, now, now to, to Winnie, you, you've been hearing all, we've been dealing mostly with um, sexual harassment and, and power dynamics in Hollywood and in uh, politics, in media. But I would like you to talk about how this affects, um, first of all, you could talk about how what's happened with aid workers uh, in, in uh, all over the world, but also how I know you think that this is not just about gender inequality, it's really about economic inequality and how that plays out in most countries in the world, not just the ones here we're talking about. Thank you, Elizabeth. I agree with your discourse on power. And indeed, I'm here because I want to speak about to bring to you the stories of ordinary women, poor women in developing countries. And I think all the women of the world have to be grateful to American women for taking a stand and saying, me too. That, that has brought renewed attention to a problem that's really deep. I think of women in the developing countries, poor women. Who are they? They are domestic workers. They are women working in the informal sector. They are the women who grow and process the food we eat. They are in the garment industries making our clothes. They are assembling the phones and all the gadgets that we have. They are at the bottom of the supply chains of big business, of the CEOs who are here. They are their employees. But we, Oxfam, when we work with them, they tell us stories about their lives. We interviewed hotel housekeepers in the Dominican Republic, in Thailand, and in Canada, developed, developing. All of them told us that they had faced sexual harassment or known someone who had faced sexual harassment. It goes on with impunity. Domestic workers globally, they suffer abuse. Some of them are like slaves in the homes where they work. A convention was signed for domestic workers. Only a few countries have ratified it. This, they continue to suffer abuse. So why is this? Not an accident that women are abused sexually at work and at home. It's not an accident. These social norms that are there to justify their economic exploitation that's, that's why I think it's so important to tackle economic inequality in order to end violence against women. You have to tackle both together. If we don't, sexual violence, norms are justified, we'll just continue. I, I see three things that need to be done. One is that we have to take out all the laws that discriminate against women in the economy. The World Bank has said at least 155 countries have got at least one law that discriminates women in the economy. 155 countries. There's work to do there. And then we have to tackle the social norms, the beliefs, the attitudes that justify sexual exploitation and abuse at work. And these, I'm afraid the private sector thinks that it doesn't have a role here that is for NGOs like Oxfam to persuade people, men to behave well. No, the private sector has an important role to play. They can use their factories, how they source their, their products, how they, they advertise. This is a powerful a power they have to tackle these social norms. Unilever is doing it. We've worked with them. They are looking at the entire supply chain 
and looking at how to tackle the social norms that justify violence against women through advertising, through factories, through, and that's, we want to see the whole business sector do that. And then lastly, we must bring women in decision-making everywhere, not just in parliaments, but at home to have their voice heard, in schools to have girls heard, yes. at work to have them listened to in the workplaces and promoted to lead, and to get them into boards and all that. If they don't have power, your discourse on power, this, this justification of sexual exploitation will not end. On that, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, let me try and take that back to Peggy and say it's a different, different um, scenario here. But as you were coming up from, through Microsoft, it's one of these very senior leadership positions, you know, we often hear that sexual harassment is not about sex, it's about power. But um, did you find, did, with other women you know as well, that there's less of it as you get more and more you get higher up on the food chain at your company? Right, Or how yeah. does, it, does it change in some way? It definitely does. Um, so I was 25 years with Qualcomm and three years with Microsoft, so almost 30 years in the tech industry. Um, and things have definitely changed personally for me as I moved up. Clearly the power dynamic shrunk, and so I experienced um, less of that. I, I would say it's very interesting. Um, when the Me Too campaign first came out, I remember talking to a group of my friends and they said, well, it should have been hashtag who hasn't. You know, because literally everybody has a story. And, um, but coming up through those years, it, our ability to react to it was, was not very strong. Unfortunately, um, we had the whisper network. And, and I, you know, I think about all the cycles that we spent going the long way around the building so you didn't have to go by someone's office who might say something inappropriate about your dress or the customer who you wanted to end that dinner and say, I've got to go because you didn't want to be propositioned. All those cycles that we could have been doing something else, something that furthered our career, that enhanced our career. I mean, so not only should we be changing this because it's the right thing to do, there's a business impact to this. Yeah. And, and that just angers me when I look back at it now. But um, I would say there's an interesting story that just came to light. I have a daughter who's just entered the tech industry. And uh, she told me the other day, she said, you know, mom, when I'm at work and I hear inappropriate jokes, I don't laugh. Yeah. Hmm. And I said, I thought to myself first, I always laughed. I thought I had to. And um, it just makes me emotional to think about it because she's not laughing because she said she learned it from me. And I said, um, I'm looking back at my 25-year-old self, and I said, I don't think she, you learned it from me. She said, Mom, you would, never, you would never laugh at those jokes. She learned it from my 50-year-old self right. mm -hmm. because I don't anymore because I'm in that position of power. Right. Right. So we are having impact. Our daughters aren't putting up with that. And... Um, I think whenever I, I feel discouraged, I just look at her and say, you know, it's changing. It's changing slowly, but it's changing. There's a real divide I've found in, in, um, in our... Um, <laughs> yeah. I've just noticed a real divide between 30 and under and 30 and above. Absolutely. And, you know, 30 and overs always say, just haul off and hit him, just ignore, you know, and the 30 and unders are, they were educated differently. They went to college at a different time than we did. And there's, you're right, they don't put up with it. They don't, yeah, so. they shouldn't. Let me ask you about you, um, your, um, uh, your, uh, your background. You come from a country originally uh, that was, uh, that has had um, serious issues with, with violence against women. And how has that informed, uh, I know you, you know, haven't lived there, but how, very, uh, but how has that informed how you think about things? Um, so we were, we were at a session earlier with uh, one of the great Canadian women I know, Dale Hatton, and we were talking about, you know, how, how has your life story affected the work that you do now? And I guarantee you that everybody in this room has a story that drives them. For me, uh, politics, 
I was telling the group earlier, has affected my life since literally the moment I was born, uh, a refugee on foreign soil. And I was raised by a single mother. And I looked around and I saw all the ways that she was hustling to make sure that her daughters, though they were poor, never knew that they were poor. Though they lived in very unstable conditions, were taught to believe that anything was possible for them. And she found that courage because, you know, we may think of Afghanistan today as this place where oppression against women is uh, the norm and continues to this day. But she grew up in an era where her father, when she was born, looked at her and said, you're going to be the first female doctor in the family. She got a scholarship to study medicine. And then the war happened. And the war happened for a number of reasons, but I sincerely believe that a big part of it is because for too long, people who were out of touch with the realities of the majority of people were sitting around those tables making decisions on their behalf and forgot the most vulnerable, which I think is the most important responsibility of leaders. So how has that affected my life? I'm the lucky 1% of refugees who make it alive of their uh, country and get to a place where not only are they integrated in their community, not only do they belong in their community, I'm from Peterborough, Ontario, it's the only place I've ever belonged, but beyond that, I need to put my name on a ballot and actually try to make things better for that community that gave me a second chance. How has that informed me? Well, these hard-won gains that enable people like me to come to places like Canada to benefit from the privileges that exist there, this country of charter of rights and freedoms, the privileges that allow women like us to make differences like we do in the fields that we are able to feel safe and competent and well, these hard won gains can be taken away overnight. And if we're not vigilant and if we're not careful and if we're not bringing along those who don't really understand why it's important to include these voices, if we're not able to remember our history and those who fought for these gains, will we become really vulnerable in this age, in this day, to have all that begun? So how has that shaped me? My job is to ensure that the work that our government does around feminism around gender equality and inclusion, that we do it in a sustainable way, but ensure that we're inspiring the next generation of leaders to come and pick up the work and most importantly, inspire those who never would have dreamed of putting their names on a ballot and to run for positions of power and influence. Let me ask Lisa the same question. How is, well, uh, you know, we don't have to go into a confessional here, but if you wanted to share with the audience how your experiences in um, pretty much of a, a, a male-dominated dominated field mm -hmm. uh, shaped you, and obviously you've thrown you know, yourself behind these two very influential ad campaigns. Well, before I answer the question, I just have to say that um, we've talked about a lot. This, there's no silver bullet to solving this right. issue, right? And I think we've touched on a number of them. I think the one you just mentioned that I think is important to get on the table is the notion of accountability and leadership. And I think that we could all take a page, at least as Americans, from what the Canadians do, and they totally walk the talk. I mean, they, they really do deliver on that. So my, my hat's out to you. Um, as far as, um, you know, I have a slightly different story um, if we are having a confessional. <laughs> um, I said you didn't have to. <laughs> I wasn't planning on it, but why not? Um, because the other issue I think is uh, it, that we're talking about is the notion of transparency and the ability right. to be transparent. You know, I grew up, um, I came up through a corporate um, career, spent 30 years in corporate America. And for the first 15 of those years, I lived in the closet as a, as a gay woman because I did not feel safe to come out. Uh, and I would sit around rooms and ha listen to people telling jokes about gay people um, that would just rip my heart out. But I didn't have the courage uh, to really own and be who I was fully because I really thought it was gonna hurt my career. 
And it's a little bit of a different um, issue, but it sort of comes from the same place as the issue we're talking about here. And I think it is perpetuated by the same notion of lack of education, power, putting people down who don't look like them, who don't act like them. Um, and so for me, because of that experience, when I finally did have the courage to come out and determine for myself that I was never going to be in a corporate closet or any closet ever again, um, I was so um, moved uh, by how free I felt after I was able to come clean and how much more creative I was and how much sharper I was. And I actually did my best work as, a, as, a, as an executive. I was happier when I could bring my whole self to work. And so issues like sexual assault or access to education or all these things that people are less than move me to my core because I personally experienced what it was like. Mm. Let me, um, <laughs> Dacker, let me ask you about, um, is it, you talk about the different reactions over generally between of men and women to power. Is it possible to um, uh, raise, raise boys, teach men to react to power differently? Is there, I mean, is there a, is there a method here that can, is, could something be done? Yeah, I'm, you don't want me to say no to that question, so. <laughs> well, you can. Uh, I think it's pretty much, uh, yeah, no, I think But that, what is it? I mean, yeah, well, I what think. What do you do? I think what's happening uh, worldwide, and Davos reflects this, is the model of power is really changing pretty dynamically in many different spheres. It's more horizontal, it's collaborative. Uh, I do a lot of consulting at Google and Facebook, and you can barely detect who's, who's running the big operation, um, who's the manager. So the, we, we have shifted historically, and I write about this in The Power Paradox, from kind of a top-down Machiavellian, you know, take people down to rise to the top mode. That's still around. Men tend to gravitate to that model of power a little bit more uh, probabilistically. But we're moving towards this more collaborative model. And there are really simple ways you can teach men to amplify those skills. They are So for example? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm seeing a personal dimension to this. OK. Um, yeah, you. Um, That's right. Women take notes. Men uh, don't. <laughs> Generally, men don't. So teach notes. men how to take notes, <laughs> right. for example, is right. one. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to change the culture of schools to be more about empathy and a little bit more cooperative. There's a ton of work on that very issue. You have to. I'll give you an example that I've been uh, partially involved in. You have to change the culture of medical schools, where there is a lot of sexual harassment in American medical schools. Because uh, I work with uh, female doctors who are running very big projects. So you have to build in empathy uh, and how to teach empathy, which is a simple language it's to skill. It's you can teach empathy? Yeah, very easily. So inside out taught empathy, right. that's an example. <laughs> so, um, so there are many angles to how to amplify those tendencies in men. And raising boys differently. Yeah. Right. I'll just say that yeah. at the Ad Council, we did a campaign called Teach Early, mm -hmm. which was really all about dads teaching their young boys what's acceptable behavior and yeah. what is not. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, dads teach boys how to, and it's really based on um, domestic abuse, who to hit, who not to hit. So basically, they, you, know, you teach your son how to hit a baseball, how to hit a jump shot, how to hit the net. But we should really be talking to them about who not to hit and why. So I think that there's yeah. some education and awareness there too. Yeah. Peggy, did you Absolutely. want to say something before? Yeah, go ahead. Um, just real quickly, I think one of the things that we should do is highlight leadership qualities beyond aggressiveness, assertiveness, right. Right. Um, being yeah. introverted and quiet is OK, too. And yeah. in fact, that's a, that can be an actually, actually a very good yes. leadership yeah. quality, being collaborative. Um, being team oriented. And I think for too long, we were weighted toward uh, the, the more aggressive ones. And so if you had those, then you were put into positions of power. And exactly. if you didn't have those, you weren't. And that affected females um, you know, far more than men. Certainly, there are quiet men, too. But it did affect females. And you know, just on that, Janet Hyde has looked at all kinds of sectors uh, worldwide. And we are moving away from aggression toward collaboration slowly in leadership. But our concepts of who should be a leader are lagging behind in some sense. And so we do need to profile that. Yeah. Interesting. Winnie, um, with, um, with Oxfam workers, with the male <clears throat> Oxfam workers, how are you 
how, how do you train them to um, not do this? Not, you know, what, what kind of training do they get? And then secondly, how do you encourage more reporting among women, generally among women? You know, it's interesting you ask about training, but I want to return to power before I talk to training. Let me give you an example. South Africa was the last country to be decolonized in Africa. It had this evil system of apartheid, racial discrimination. When it ended, we all went there. We could never go where we, the rest of Africa boycotted apartheid South Africa. But what I found so interesting is that going to South Africa that was post-apartheid, you can't find there one single person easily who will say that I believe in apartheid and racial discrimination. I ask myself, where did they all go? <laughs> power shifted. Power. When power changed, it became impossible to justify racial discrimination, racial oppression. The power shifted and said it's not justifiable. So I insist on this question of power, that Powerless people cannot challenge sexual exploitation and abuse. So in an institution like ours in Oxfam, when I was given the leadership, the global leadership, I knew that to change the culture of the institution, to make it an institution where women and men are all safe and have lives of dignity, that I needed to shift power. So, I worked to create my, my own team that's gender balanced. So today I have a team of nine. I'm, I'm the leader of the team. We are nine. There are five men, four women, but I'm the boss. Right. And my number two <laughs> is also a woman. So it's five and four, but I have moved to the regional level. Seven regional directors, all appointed when I've been the leader. Two are men. Five are women, and we're moving to the country level, but that picture is, because we have more than 70 country offices, it's going to take longer to, to shift power to women. But I can tell you that the discussions we have in my team at the regional level, the, the, it's, not go, it's not easy to justify or to make jokes that justify uh, putting down women. So that's important for us, to shift power, to give women power in institutions. But yes, you also have to align the organizational culture with those values of equality. And that's harder. That's when you talk about training, awareness raising, and questioning, and putting it through all the institutional processes from recruitment, promotion, to, mm -hmm. to, to behaviors at work. I mean, even just being in a room and you say something as a woman and the moderator moves on and the man says it and then they say, oh, thank you for saying that. <laughs> and it was said before. Right. I mean, it's just devaluing the abilities and the knowledge of women and it's happening all the time around us. But you can't challenge it first without putting women in positions of power right. to, challenge, to challenge it. Right. Okay, we are exactly at 20 minutes, so and I promise I would open it up. I bet you have lots of questions. Uh, just raise your hand. We have a, a microphone here. Uh, over, over here on the, yeah. Uh, on the, yes, on the, uh, there's a man first, and then there's, well, you go first, and then we'll, there's a, a gentleman <laughs> over n near you. <laughs> Nelly Kroos from the Netherlands. Um, I'm a great admirer of the government of Trudeau. I think he is absolutely a movement for everywhere, also in Europe, that you have to stick to at least 50% of your team being female. Having said that, just one fact, the Me Too uh, movement started in 2006. That was a hashtag at that time in LA. And it is a lesson to learn, I think, that when you are not keeping the line, then it's slowing down. Mm -hmm. For then, the sexy element is away. That in a double sense, so to say. Having said that, and I'm looking at Winnie. Perhaps, uh, sorry, <laughs> finish your job. Um, <laughs> could, could you add to your list of activities? Anyhow, for me, an 
awful um, experience when you are traveling in Italy, but not only in Italy, and not on the highways, but a little bit uh, to the outside. There are so many young women, 13 years, 14 years old. What is happening? The mafia is paying money, and they do have a business model for later on for themselves. The mafia is taking the nice girls out of the group of refugees. Hundreds per month in Italy alone. It is a shame, and I think if you can yeah. take that issue to your list to do, then mm -hmm. we will be mm -hmm. yeah, backing you. So, yes, did you want to say? Yeah, thank you very much for, for your comments. Uh, if I may, as I said, violence and harassment, especially gendered, have been going on for long before any of us were born. What's different right now, I think social media is helping to amplify voices, of course. Women are finding courage in one another's voices and in each other's courage. But I think what needs to be acknowledged here right now is first and foremost, this is not an issue that one sector can challenge and tackle and resolve. And so it is not up to the NGOs to do this work alone. It is not mm. up to governments to do this work alone, nor is it for the private sector to do this work alone. The only way that we're going to be able to get there is if it's a cross-sectoral approach, if it's intergenerational, multicultural, multi-faith, because faith leaders have a lot of power and influence and have been part of effective solutions in the past. And if we engage men and boys, and I want to put that out there. And what is different and what is worth applaud is that media, traditional media, is playing a positive role. Traditional media is part of the solution. Uh, the, the Americans, you folks have had New York Times take the lead. In Canada, we've had the Toronto Star. We've had the Globe and Mail take really positive stances. And I think that's the only way that we're gonna get this work uh, moving as quickly as we need to so that our daughters and granddaughters get to live in a better world. Uh, and the change that needs to happen happens much more quickly. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. Firstly, the wonderful comments. Uh, it, it is interesting. I'm, I'm chairman and CEO of Tupperware brand, so cool. I have 3.2 million women who <laughs> tell me what to do, and they're <laughs> outspoken. And we really focus on really uh, the whole concept of when she has confidence, she makes a difference. And one thing that I think is really amazing, a number of us in this room who have been pushing gender parity at Davos, uh, a dozen years ago, there wasn't a single damn meeting in Congress Hall on women. Yeah. Now there's more than a dozen happening. So I even thought I wouldn't get invited back because I complained, but it's changing. <laughs> What's his name? Let me tell you, the question that I, that I really have, this important narrative right now that has, I believe, sunlight's the best disinfectant. Now that this has come out, I don't believe there's ever going to be a statue to Harvey Weinstein. But as we're thinking <laughs> of this subject, uh, I live in Charlottesville, uh, mm -hmm. one of the most liberal towns in the world and most educated, open-minded. That was the site of something mm -hmm. terrible. And now we go in there, and there's statues that are covered, draped. And even as late as uh, weeks mm -hmm. ago, they talked about Jefferson. We're going to put drape his statues. I'm thinking now about leadership in this country. What about in the White House? When do we go back to presidents like Kennedy, who is clearly a sexual predator uh, in the White House? How are we going to rethink those? Because there's lots of statues. There's lots of streets. There's lots of schools named after him. And this is a real quandary right now, because when I consider more than 25% of people they meet their, the love of their life at work. And mm -hmm. how do you go from innocent, very innocent uh, uh, you know, engagement to this horrific predatory behavior? And I valued so much your comments on power because we see that happen. 
But are we going to reinterpret history about this and talking about some people that we say that are, I want to be like him, <laughs> legends like that, who were actually not legends. Yeah. They were predators, and history is full of them out there. I think that needs to come out as well. What do we do about that? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody want to answer that question? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, I, you know, we don't silence voices. We march in the Women's March, and you have one of the most powerful, absolutely powerful rights in the world. You can vote. Yes. Vote. That's what we can do about it. Uh, here's a, a question here, a woman uh, in a white suit. Hi, I'm a Saudi woman, a global shaper from Saudi Arabia. And I run women initiatives to empower women from rural areas or low socioeconomic backgrounds for them to have more confidence to do anything they want. And I wanted to hear what you believe um, are ways to boost confidence in women, especially young women um, in primary and high school, um, to aid my initiatives also. I'll, I'll, Go ahead. I'll start. I mean, there are probably a number of ways. I think one of the things that I think about, because we work in the media and, and, and with advertising, we have the saying, if you can't see her, you can't be her. And I think that there's an enormous responsibility that people in the media who are either making content for television or every platform of, around, or producing advertising, those con if you think about how that content has shifted over time, those images in the past were perpetuating stereotypes. Yeah. And I think now, there is um, a real pressure for that content to reflect the reality that women um, are very diverse in every way. And we should continue to put images, uh, positive, empowering images of women um, out there for our young daughters to see and to say for themselves, if, that's, if I see her, I can be here. You heard Oprah Winfrey, perhaps, at the Golden Globes talk about the power of seeing Harry Belafonte receive an award, the first African-American ever to receive a Golden Globe, when she was sitting on the floor of her kitchen. And she realized, wow, if he can do that, maybe that can be me someday. And so I think that as, 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 as leaders, we should think about all of the ways that we put images across our multiple platforms out into the world and hold ourselves to a very high standard about what, that, what those images look like. So I can... Canada is leading the G7 presidency this year, and gender <coughs> equality is woven throughout. And one area where I'm particularly excited about focusing on is the importance of role models. Mm -hmm. More than just seeing her, hearing her stories of how she was able to overcome obstacles and what helped her are critical. And so uh, Sydney Poitier is a really good example of that seeing and believing that you can do it. I think for all of us, the importance of being kind to one another is an important element of empowerment. The solidarity and the sisterhood that has afforded us the privileges that we do have needs to carry on and be strengthened. Uh, and lastly, I, firstly, you go girl, because what you're doing, <laughs> you yourself Seriously. are a positive role model. and. Your story is one that I'm going to be sharing, so I hope we get to connect after this. <laughs> one thing that helped me as a young, racialized uh, woman uh, in a mixed rural urban community uh, was volunteering. And, you know, as women and girls, we hear a lot of contradicting messages, you know, be strong and be tough, but don't be too bossy, for example. But when you're able to do something with your own hands and talent, when you're able to surround yourself with mentors and champions who are able to pick you up when you've fallen and give you that you know, push when you need a push, when you're able to make a difference in your community and see that change inspire others, for me, that's been the greatest source of confidence and empowerment. Winnie? Yeah, I, you... you I, I want to know your name, the yeah. CEO, <laughs> who's been championing gender equality, more women participation at the WEF platform. But you mentioned something important about what we do with history. Yeah. Yeah. We, are, we have 
celebrated people in our past who were predators, whose values today we shun. What do we do about that? Because a lot of the people who built our nations, who took us forward, did not respect women, did not believe in equality. I think that's an important question. And every country must face up to this and say, if our values are gender equality, if we respect men and women equally, treat them equally, then we are going to put this amongst the values that we honor. What do we honor now going forward? I don't think it's helpful to go dismantling the past. The past is the past. But you can refuse to honor aspects of it that you don't believe in anymore. But now going forward, what do you honor? What does a country honor? And here I find it, it interesting that um, leadership what we call leadership, what we honor in leadership broadly, is so defined by men. Mm. So and we need to revise that because we need to be able to say that now what we honor are not the conquerors, but the peacemakers. What we honor are not those who won the wars, but those who built communities. Are there heroes and heroines there? So by looking at our values in a fresh way, we will honor different things going forward, and we will have many women heroines going forward. But with leadership as it is defined now, we will still have more and more male heroes because we look at successful leadership in, through the eyes of a man. And uh, so again, I also want to reply to your question about young people and strengthening their leadership and their values on gender equality, we have a challenge of, of tackling <coughs> male privilege and masculinities that are harmful and that are aggressive. This starts with children in the home. It's about socializing in the, in the family and then in the schools. And I see that this family work is left to NGOs like Oxfam. But again, I say, no, if we're going to change that, we have like, I'm trying to remember the name. Minister Yusuf has Answer. Mariam, as Mariam has <laughs> said, this has to be something that we all join in to change the norm at the family level, what a good boy is, right. what a good man will be. There's a um, man back there had his hand up. Hi, I'm not quite sure which role I should introduce myself in, but I introduce myself as a father of two kids, a boy and a girl. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether um, there is time for a truth and reconciliation commission <laughs> in which we own up to all of the harassment, sexual or otherwise, that I'm sure many of us in this room have participated in. Do you think it might be a good idea maybe to do that on Facebook or LinkedIn or one of the other social media platforms? Who wants to take that? So in Canada, we, we led, we were part of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to focus on the oppression and the injustices that the First Peoples of Canada, Indigenous peoples, experienced through hundreds of years of colonization. And so it's, it's a mighty task. And it, it took, I think, about five years to complete the work it's led to recommendations that we are all bound to address. I think that one way, I, I would, this is my first time here, and so what I'd like to see is how will the private sector invest in the women's movement so that NGOs who have the solutions can be further empowered and sustained to continue to do the work? How will the thought leaders and policymakers and world leaders and employers, 3.2 million women tell you what to do, sir, and you are probably better off for it. Your bottom line has improved. My hope is that when we leave Davos in this year, when we have an entirely female-led co-chair panel, 
that something is done differently and that when we come back next year, we see more than 21% women here and that numbers that number continues to go up. But I think it is incumbent upon men with privilege and power and compassion like you, sir, to take the lead as the women's movement has, to self-organize because you have power and the tools to do it and to bring the rest of us along with you because in this work, I think the big takeaway for me is we have many allies, that we are not alone and we live in a moment in time when significant radical change is possible. So if you would like to discuss this further and see how we in Canada can be part of this work, uh, I'd love to talk to you after this. Great, Could, I, we think we have time right here. One more question, one or, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm um, on the board of Planned Parenthood and a national board yes. chair. Um, and so, um, so I thank you for this panel and the work um, that you all are doing. Um, but I've had a front row seat to the movement as it's, as it's begun. Um, and it's the, one of the most diverse movements I think I've yep. really seen in, um, in a lot of the work and, and very intersectional, right? So that it's centering not just women, but women of color. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm curious from your perspective, particularly the corporate perspective, how you see that intersectionality growing inside your, in the work that you're doing, um, because I think a, that that's important. And my, my, um, kind of corollary to that question is how, um, how are you kind of connecting the dots between the, the bright line around what sexual harassment is to the more in, insidious variant of, of kind of benevolent sexism that I think is, is really challenging for us to, to navigate as a right. community. Why don't you grab that? Yeah, so um, I, on to your first question, uh, more and more um, we, you know, you get up, you go to work. It's not just a job. You, there needs to be a, more of a purpose for what you're up to every day for the number of hours you spend there. And at Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And we weave that into everything we do. And that in particular resonates with new, again, the millennials coming into the company because they're holding us accountable to that statement. They are choosing their companies these days because of the purpose, the, the, the reason that company is existing. And that, again, going back to a business impact, we must be aware of that. Otherwise, we will never hire another person, <laughs> certainly not of that age. So I think that is very important that you interweave purpose with you know, your daily job. Great. All right. I'm now tasked with summing up this extremely interesting panel. Thank you all for your participation and your comments. They were real. I mean, I was riveted. Um, so I have to conclude. Um, we are, uh, we, I think our general conclusions are there need to be more women in power, um, that um, both the private sector and the government need to do their part in different ways, uh, and that empathy can be taught. <laughs> so thank you all. Um, I want to end on time because I was warned if I didn't, I would be in big trouble. And um, thank you all for your participation and for coming. And I'm sure I can't promise, but I bet some people will be able to answer questions afterwards. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>